Good evening and welcome to NAEA's Eighth Town Hall. This is Art Education and Teacher Leadership, Contributing to School Culture and Success. This is a long conversation this evening with some very special guests whom you will meet shortly. I am Mari Rosero. I have the great privilege and honor of being the Executive Director of the National Art Education Association. And I'm a lifelong educator and champion of the arts. Uh, I have great classroom experience uh, in the trenches with my students uh, back in Pittsburgh and Chicago, but also great time in uh, central office and leading the arts at a district level with Chicago Public Schools and Pittsburgh Public Schools, but really glad to be at NAEA. And a few things before we get started. First of all, um, just want to acknowledge um, the First People and First Nations in each of the communities where we live and reside. I'm in Washington, D.C., and this is the home of the Piscataway. And we also just like to take a moment to acknowledge um, all the trials and tribulations that everyone has survived this past year. I mean, quite an unprecedented year, but we sure appreciate your tenacity and your energy and spirit. And um, thank you for taking time to join us this evening in conversation. Uh, please know that uh, closed captioning is an option. If you go under live transcript, you can turn on the closed captioning. And we suggest that the best view is speaker view. So you should be able to see all of our guests uh, in that view when they're in conversation. So uh, today we will be talking about um, the role of art teachers as leaders in their school communities. Um, this is also a personal journey of my own, so I'm really a big uh, adamant supporter of this, but really unpacking from multiple perspectives how the art teacher is really at this critical juncture of students, family, community, uh, their peer teachers and colleagues, and really uniquely situated because of their experience um, with students over time, their experience um, uh, working with limited resources, with advocacy, um, with community building, and that they really can contribute to overall student success from a number of vantage points. So we're going to hear from some really great experts shortly. Um, the town hall concept, uh, we live and breathe that because uh, many of you who are on tonight submitted questions in advance, and those questions will uh, give us the form and shape of our conversation tonight, and you'll probably hear your name called out as we work through your questions. If we have time, we will certainly uh, work to prioritize a few minutes at the end. So if you put any questions or comments in the chat, we'll work to monitor it. But I will say oftentimes our conversations are so robust that we get we end up with some limited time at the end, but we will certainly try our best and I'll monitor throughout. But feel free to keep the chat active. Um, if you haven't joined us for a town hall before, what you can expect to experience um, is a conversational relay. You will see pairs of individuals in conversations. They Each pair will have six minutes on the clock, and um, they will have a conversation based on member questions for five minutes. You'll hear a bell usually at that five-minute mark, and there'll be one minute to wrap up. And then when that conversation wraps up, one of those guests will leave, a new one will come in, and the conversation will continue in a new and different direction. And if that makes sense, great. If not, don't worry about it because you're going to experience it and it all makes sense as you live through it, I promise. So um, I believe I've covered all the logistics. And let me go ahead and make sure that I'm in the right view and that my team has got this in the right view platform. So give me one second. All right, Dennis, can we get off of screen share just so we're on the guest? Thank you so much. That's probably a little bit easier for folks. All right, so now it's a good idea to go into that um, uh, speaker view. So now you can see the folks that are talking. So it's my great privilege and honor to introduce a colleague that I am working with on a, on a couple projects right now. But uh, Dr. Gregory C. Hutchings Jr. is the superintendent of Alexandria City Public Schools in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you know, uh, NAEA headquarters is in Old Town Alexandria, so we are very close neighbors. So this is our, our local school district. So I'm really pleased that Gregory could join us this evening. So hello, sir. Welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much for joining. Yes, thank you for having me. 
It's really good to see you. So we're going to jump right in. We want to use all of our minutes to really uh, make sure that we're meeting the needs of our guests. So um, we know it's been a really unique school year. And so I just want to, first of all, just give you props for, you know, uh, running a tight ship, uh, taking care of your families, your students, your teachers. Uh, I really admire and respect you. So thank you for all your energy that you gave to your community. And thanks for making time for us this evening. So um, Bethany from New York has this question. What are the challenges that art educators face as they work to become school building leaders? So as art teachers work to become building leaders in their schools, um, what are some of those challenges and how can they overcome those obstacles? Yeah. You know, I, I think that's one a great question. And I think a lot of the challenges that art education, ed educators face is the fact that people don't respect the art profession. You know, they think it's all just fun and games. And it, there is a science to art, um, especially when you're talking about creativity. They have degrees. <laughs> you have to go to school to be an art teacher or art educator. And um, I think that really is where it starts. And we have to um, work on making sure that misconception around what art educators can bring to the table um, is really tackled. Uh, but I think that's one of definitely the challenges uh, that, that we see. And I, I have to say that I have seen some phenomenal art educators become um, excellent building leaders as well as central office um, administrators. And they bring one, the creativity and the innovation to the table. And that's something that I think you should cherish um, as an art educator. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, as an art educator myself, I, I, I know what that is like to, you know, like I love being in my classroom and I love, you know, I mean, just making work with students all day long is so inspiring, but you can't close the door off to the rest of the school. That's right. And it, took me a, it took me a few years to understand that and to really like find that bold. I mean, I don't have any trouble finding boldness in myself now, but back in the day, I might've had to do a little work at it, but to find that boldness to step out and make those connections. And I'll tell you what, sometimes it takes a leader in a critical role to, you know, sort of see that opportunity or see that like emerging leadership and, and foster it because you know, mentorship makes a big difference. Huge difference. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So our colleague Janet in California uh, wants to know what are the best strategies to convince parents and the community, as well as the school district, that the arts are essential? The best strategy is, is really using our students, <laughs> right? Show your student work. I mean, that right there is pretty, I, I know it's the best strategy. Think of this, when you um, are having your art shows or you're sending home um, dif different um, activities that have happened within your classrooms and parents are just so excited, they keep them forever. I mean, I know as a parent, I cherish most of my children's art projects and the students, it's really what sells. And what helps people understand that art education is more than just an elective. Um, it is a part of the core curriculum. It allows students to use different portions of their brains that allows them to be better mathematicians, better writers, um, you know, better expressive when, when they're speaking uh, or introducing material. So, you know, it, it really deserves to be at the forefront. Um, and I think allowing the students to speak and talk and share about their experiences is what uh, is the best strategy to keep art education as an, an important factor, not only to the community, but also to school divisions. Absolutely. And, you know, I always think, you know, for young people who are finding themselves and exploring all the opportunities ahead of them, why would we want to not give them every opportunity possible to find out how to be their best self, right? And so, you know, you want to make sure the arts are part of the menu. Um, our, our colleague Trisha um, is curious about with the, the escalating uh, and, and increasing attention on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we know that this has been something on many people's minds for a long time, but we can also recognize that it's, there's, a, there's a heightened view of this right now. Um, how, how do you see movements of equity, diversity, inclusion, and even social justice impacting the arts in schools? I mean, how can you see it not? I mean, think about the Black Lives Matter um, or the Black Lives Matter uh, Plaza in DC, right? That was created by an artist. You think of, you know, all of these beautiful pictures of Breonna Taylor and uh, George Floyd. Um, artists have always been uh, those who express what's happening 
in today's times. And uh, they have been, I think, you know, one of the pinnacle moments of any, you know, major situation that's happening in our world. Uh, so us making sure that we are using uh, that perspective um, to really tell a story visually, I think is, is really key. And it is so important, especially as we're doing this journey of anti-racism in Alexandria City Public Schools, uh, we're utilizing, um, you know, our, our students' innovation and creativity with expressing their truth. And many can do that through through artwork um, and expression. So yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it has a rightful place um, in any movement, especially now when we're dealing with this dual pandemic, one being coronavirus, the other being the racial pandemic we've been experiencing for over 400 years. Yep. I mean, that, that connection is just built in. And, you know, I, I'll let you into a conversation that we often have among art educators is that sometimes there's some healthy tension around the acquisition of skills and the, and the quality of your skills versus the content and the, the, you know, what you're reflecting or representing or reacting to. And I say, you don't have to choose one or the other. Every, you know, all these things are available to you and they are so connected because I'll tell you what, I can't tell you any artist that I admire that isn't reflecting their time, place and culture, as well as the, the news that's living around them of the time. And so, you know, I just really invite folks to think about how all these pieces really come together in the arts and that that really matters for our young people. So um, our this time goes so fast. Yeah, we're, already yeah. at, we're already <laughs> at our closing question for our segment of the conversation. So uh, we uh, always embed this question in all of our town halls, uh, especially given this past year, but we'd like to know, you know, what are your tips for self care that have helped you uh, weather and survive this past year? So one, I think just uh, making sure you find time to yourself and uh, whatever that is, you know, for me, I have been running and working out. I've lost 20 pounds. <laughs> I'm in the best shape of my life over the pandemic. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, I gained 20 pounds, um, but that was how I stay insane. You know, I, I, I can't tell everybody to do what I've done, but you have to find what is right for you that allows you to have peace and relaxation and you have to make sure you make that time for yourself and be unapologetic about it. I think sometimes we're working so hard through this pandemic, we feel we have to be every place at every time. And you do have to say, you know what, I need a break and I got to take a moment away and step out, whatever that requires you to do and do it, or you won't be good for anyone else. Yep. I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's all about managing that time because boy, that Zoom office doesn't really go, there's no travel time. <laughs> Yeah, right. There really isn't. And you, and you know what, you, you can't, you can't break away from work and life, That's right. you know, like it's all blended now and with this, with this uh, pandemic. So you got to well, make Dr. it. Dr. Hutchings, thank you so much for the conversation. And I'm, I'm going to take my exit and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you. And I have the pleasure of welcoming John Green Otero, who is our creative learning initiative district wide coordinator um, for Austin independent school district in Austin, Texas. And uh, let's join in. I hope that you all can join me in welcoming uh, John to this discussion. So Brad from uh, Tennessee wants to know, John, how do you see the recent movements for diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice impacting the role of the arts in our schools? That's a big question, right? Um, the short answer is it currently is, right? Like it currently is impacting and it has been impacting diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice conversations. Um, it also has tremendous opportunity. That's sort of the second part of that short answer. The long answer is when I start to think about what is happening right now, I think about all the artists out there, all the organizations that throughout, as you both were talking about, you and Mario were talking about, they rely on the arts to regulate, to express, to digest, to, to counter whatever it is that's going on in our zeitgeist. Right, And I don't worry so much about them in this conversation because I know they have the tools developed to be able to engage in that conversation in, th in authentic ways. The, the people and the groups that I worry about are the ones that either don't have access, right? Or have yet to experience the, the value of what the arts can do in this context. And, and those are the ones I'm deeply concerned about because they are not, they may have other systems to support them through this hard time, through these two pandemics that you were talking about. But 
more often than not, they don't. More often than not, access issues are really prevalent with certain demographics in certain communities. And it's causing them to, to have an additional strain on their systems, biological, psychological, emotional systems that are gonna make it harder and harder for them to bounce back as things get better, right? And to engage in a critical conversation that they need to be a part of, right? That's gonna shape the future. So I think there's tremendous opportunity here for leaders, teacher leaders to go out there and, and look at their systems and look at their communities and say, where are the issues of access here? How can I help transition and change the way some people see and value the arts to better engage in this context? And because this is so important, they, they'll have opportunities to bring it up more and more often. Yes, John, you are like speaking it. I love it. Speak your truth. And um, I, I'm, I'm ready to come work in your school division and hang out with you. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you. So I, I want to ask a question that's coming from uh, Kristen in California. She said, how can art teachers advocate for their program needs without coming off like a constant complainer? I'm, I'm sure you hear this a lot. I know I hear it a lot in our school division. Uh, but, you know, what advice would you give? Our teachers, you know, to, to advocate, but not to appear as if they're complaining um, about, you know, not having what they need. Absolutely. It's such a tricky line, right? Because you're so passionate about something. And sometimes that passion comes across in ways that people don't, don't like, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is twofold. One, uh, do the work to think about your system, your environment, the people in your circles and think about what their priorities are. Think about what is happening in your, let's say in a school that you can lean into, understand deeply why the other person is passionate about, for example, student scores, student achievement, and then help them bridge their understanding with student achievement with the arts, right? There is a wealth of resource out there. You and Mario were talking about this. You know, almost every organization has some version of it. There's a wealth of resources out there that show the deep, deep emotional, psychological, physiological, neurological, behavioral, academic benefits to the arts, right? So you don't need to go far to find the fuel to, to bring to those conversations. The question is, who's gonna do the work of making that connection with another person, making that connection with another leader, right? So you have a tremendous opportunity because of your passion, because of your knowledge to be able to bridge those conversations. And if you can lean in and privilege their priorities, their belief systems, their perspectives, they'll feel seen and heard and be more willing to listen to you. That's so true. Um, and that socially emotional academic learning component is real and we must keep that before, especially now with all of the trauma that we're all experiencing through this global uh, pandemic. I just wanna say one thing real quick. And the second thing I really wanna say is be authentically you. Yes. You have no idea the power and the beauty of just being authentically you. Be you, be the rock star you are and bring people to see you. You know, I, I tell people this all the time, when you're your authentic self, you don't have to remember what you said or what you're gonna do because you're just being you and not trying to be somebody else. That's so true, great, great Absolutely. advice. So Sarah in Pennsylvania, she asks, uh, what is the most successful leadership training initiative or strategy with which you have witnessed um, success? I'm really proud of the work. I've been working in Austin and Penn School for about 10 years. I oversee the Creative Learning Initiative and we've leveraged a lot of our resources into mentorship and coaching. And you know, whichever way you sort of identify it as, it's this idea that you are developing as a leader and you're also developing other leaders, right? We are all in this together. And I think that any time you can spend to develop your capacity to mentor and coach others in really authentic ways, right? So how do you, how do you see other people and who they are, identify their priorities, lean into that conversation I was having earlier around sort of bringing other people into a conversation and help to paraphrase, transform, pivot, asking those really nuanced questions that sort of shift the conversation so that the other person is having the insight, right, that, that you know they need to have, right? And if they can own that insight, if, they, if that insight can be born from them through your mentorship, leadership, and coaching, they'll own it. And they'll take it from you without you being there to sort of, you know, herald it. Um, and I, I find that that has really transformed. So if you can change one person and then walk away, they'll end up changing two more and then two more. And all of a sudden, like my experience, I started off as a teacher 
and I changed my team and then my team changed the school and then the school changed the feeder pattern, right? 10 years later, we're in 97 schools, you know, supporting 80,000 students. So it, it's, it's amazing how powerful it can be if you really lean into your leadership and, and the knowledge that you have to impart on others. So, you know, one person at a time, you can change the world. It's pretty much what you're saying. I love that. I love that. Um, right. so, so tell us before we go to our next uh, group. So, so tell us, what are you doing in regards to your own self-care and what advice do you have for, um, for self-care for those out there? Much like you, know, you were talking about, you know, I, I, I lean into sort of my hobbies, but separately, I wanted to add community. Um, I find that leaning into your community, being honest with them, leaning on them when you need to, um, it's just so important. It's been helping me, you know, we are all achievers, we're all hard workers, we're all trying to be, you know, holding up the world. And sometimes you need to be able to sort of, just sort of fall, right? Like, not, not fall and hurt, but just sort of let yourself be for a while to recharge, to regroup. And I find that when you have a strong community that you can lean on, um, it's just, it's everything. Thank you so much, John. We, we appreciate your, your words of wisdom and I'm gonna turn things over to you. Well, thank you so much, Gregory. Uh, I want to introduce Vanessa Smart, NAEA EDNI Commissioner, Instructional Coach, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Hi, Vanessa, it's great to see you and welcome to the conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, let's get started. So from Terry on Ohio, what can arts educators do to increase social emotional learning through the arts in their school building? Okay, this is a super long, engaging and wonderful question for me. I love social emotional learning and it's probably what arts teachers have been doing all along, but never really had a framework to connect it to or just the tag words or the new lingo to understand that they really are doing this work. Um, engaging in social emotional learning is a transformative process. It occurs through um, things such as mindfulness, identity, perspective sharing, community building, and agency. And they're participating in experiences that model this growth and development of justice-oriented global citizens. Um, one framework that I do lean on is the CASEL framework. It's the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. It's CASEL.org. Um, and I wanna get into those five themes as quickly as I possibly can. Mindfulness. Um, we always in the classrooms, I'm, I'm definitely um, an instructional coach now, but I taught visual arts for over 20 years in North Carolina. The es essential questions. Um, what, what makes a person self-aware? Um, how does making art make us more mindful of ourselves? It could be in the art classroom through journaling, self-management techniques, um, creating a protection animal to fight off worry and anxiety, um, or even drawing to music. The next theme, identity. Um, how do I see myself through art? What are my strengths or biases that may be personal or cultural? And we see that so much now in the students and children, everyone is just saturated with media and everything that's going on right now. So they're aware, they're well aware. And sometimes they don't always feel supported, but the cl art classroom can become a safe space for them to have that support. and explore their identity. What are the things that they carry? How do they, how are they seen versus how they really are? How do they feel? How would their peers feel? If, do they have a personal mantra, mantra that they use daily for self-care? An emotional color wheel, even for the P12, how are you feeling today based on a color? It's, it's all valuable. The next one, perspective sharing, addressing biases. What can I learn from others? How is empathy developed through discussion about art and making art? Peer reflections. The kids are always on their phones um, as young as kindergarten. So put the phone down, have a conversation. How do you feel about this? What do you know? What are your family's thoughts? What, do you, what can you share with me that I don't already know? What are your powerful or powerless portraits? They can create artwork that reflects how they feel powerful or powerless in certain situations. Um, diversity of culture in a broader community and telling stories through art. Two more, <laughs> community building, belonging and collective and intersectionality because there are so many children who identify in different ways, who have different perspectives and those intersections are major ways that in the art classroom they can explore and learn and teach. Um, what does it mean to belong? 
Where do I belong and how do I build relationships that create a sense of belonging in the class and community? And how should we live together? We've all spoken briefly so far about the pandemic and the new awareness, I suppose, or a different type of awareness of social justice issues. So how do they get to know their community, their peers, the adults and the children in their communities? And the last one, agency. What does voice look like in art? How can I support creating agency and how am I empowered? How do I believe I can do this work and how do I or we affect change? And as John and Gregory both said, or um, just one person can make a huge, huge change and it can be art for social change. Thank you, Vanessa. I, I love, thank you for bringing up SEL and that castle framework. We, I use it so much in my work in Austin too. So it's yes. so important. Jill from Virginia wants to know, how do you encourage faculty and families to value different cultures, lifestyles through what you teach? Consistent communication um, that explores and exposes the value in connecting with parents, teachers, school leaders, and the community at large. It's key to bringing understanding and connections to your classroom and your curriculum. Invite arts professionals, cultural community leaders, or teachers, and even former students to engage with their classroom community. It could be PTA nights during performing arts events and any other opportunity your school offers to connect with parents. Students and parents and faculty need exposure to cultures and lifestyles that make us all valued members of our local and global communities and allow those school and community members who may be unsure or unaware to contribute to the art conversation and what, how, and why students create art in their classrooms and have the students go home and explain what they're doing. If the parents ask about what did you do in math, language arts, English, science. Well, mama and dad, I also did this. Grandma, look at what I made and let me explain to you how I made it and what I was thinking when I did make it. Love it. And I'm already hearing sort of building into this next question, right? So from James, I'd love to hear ideas on how to promote the arts in a school where the administration fails to see their value. I experienced this as well. And I know many arts teachers do. We're often singletons in our schools and some even have split responsibilities at different schools. Um, and it's important for art teachers to remain visible and prepared to share how they add to the school community and school success. success. Um, become involved with or become a member of the school improvement team. That connection alone will allow for insight, opportunities for input, and increased visibility for you and your arts programming. Um, and if you are engaging in social emotional learning and in your classrooms, share it with the administration, with the community. If you're a chapter sponsor, or if you have students who are members of the National Art Honor Society or the National Junior Art Honor, Honor Society, Mario, share it with the school community and with your um, administrator team. Be ready to analyze your data with colleagues and make decisions about students' needs and planning. Facilitate workshops at the school level and ensure all students succeed. Um, lead school-wide workshops, lead district PLCs. There's so many ways that teachers can be leaders and remain visible and valued in the school and in the classrooms. Um, serve as a leader or a chairperson of a group that advocates for schools or students. Um, find a way, make sure you are seen and heard at all times. I love it, seen and heard. Now you've given us all a lot of great action items, which I'm sure everyone is writing down feverishly all the things that they're <laughs> going to do, right? Um, so give us a couple more, but in this one, tips for self-care. So what are your tips for self-care? Um, the simplest way for me to put it is to find some happy and share it. I'm all about sharing. I have four children and two grandchildren of my own, so I never have anything that's mine ever. So whenever I find joy, it's usually through finding that time that we can never find. But once I get a few minutes and I regroup and regather and I feel a little bit better, I'm always mindful of how I feel. Um, I share my joy, my happy, if it's making a mess, if it's eating my favorite blackberries, whatever it is, I share. I love that, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for sharing this time with me. Absolutely, thank you. All right, next up is the Margaret Corman, our educator at Decatur Classical School, Chicago Public Schools of Chicago, Illinois. Hi, Margaret, welcome. Hey, Vanessa, thank you. Absolutely. We have another Vanessa from Alaska that asks a critical question. Mm -hmm. What are some ways to be heard in a climate of new administration in a district? I want to advocate, but meaningfully. Thank you for that question. Um, I feel very prepared for this one. I just changed schools about three years ago and 
I've had two principals in the in those three years. So, um, and I've had a total of 15 principals in my career. So I've seen a lot of administrators. And um, the first thing I want to say is what everyone on this panel has been saying, and that is we are advocates for our program every single day. Every day we walk into a classroom, our students see us, they're watching us, they notice whether we're happy or not, and it makes a huge difference. When you were talking about that happiness moment, it ha has to happen in our classrooms too, right? We need that. But um, I think the most important thing to do when you have a new administrator um, in your school or in your district is take time to get to know them. Um, a lot of times they have wonderful, fabulous ideas. My last two administrators have been incredible. And they've actually given me suggestions that have directly impacted my classroom, particularly with SEL. We're hearing this all night long, and I think it is really important that we are. Um, it has definitely changed my perspective in my teaching. So be open to their ideas. They're gonna bring things to your classroom and maybe you've been doing it as I've been teaching 31 years. Have I been doing the same thing every year? We need to switch it up. So be open to some suggestions from these administrators as well. Um, and then the second part to this uh, question I'd like to bring up is finding support, which we've been saying all night long. Um, arts partnerships, they bring big ideas to your community and to yourself, right? Um, if you go and work in these arts um, partnerships in the community, you're absorbing information and you're taking that back to your school. Art teachers in your district are great with helping you figure out how to put together a budget, all right? And if you ever are, and I have been in the seat where you have to advocate for your program, again, everyone's been saying this tonight, students and parents, that's when you pull them in but you start advocating with them every day. You don't wait until the program is up on the chopping block. That happens every single day. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I've experienced just about all of that. Thank you so much for that, Margaret. The next question is from Kimberly in Nebraska. Are your art teachers shifting from teaching elements and principles to contemporary art-based opportunities for meaning making? Um, yes. Yes, I am seeing choice in inquiry-based art education approaches locally in Chicago, on the state level, huge, and also national, all three areas. I, I literally can't go into a classroom not seeing art teachers moving forward and progressing. However, we still need our elements and principles to build our craft. And I think that's really important. Just like a writing teacher needs nouns and verbs to set up sentence structure, we also need our elements and principles to teach our craft. Um, but I wanna say, if you are shifting to a more contemporary practice, I recommend that you find a group of art educators you respect to support you during this transition. I think it's really important. I'm all about getting people to help me. And I think that's how I've been surviving 31 years is because I'm really good at trying to get people support in my classroom. Thank you for that. Um, Sarah from Washington mm -hmm. has a question. Can you tell us a time when you have used a strategy or strategies to end a bias or racist policy at your school or district? So um, I believe in teaching, you have two methods, one direct teaching and one that is indirect teaching. And I, I believe with confronting an issue, we start with direct teaching. So I was so happy you brought up so much information about SEL because in my school, and this is where I'm really happy to be working for my last two principals, they really believe in SEL and really addressing the issues, but not in a fast, quick manner, but unpacking it and working with the community to understand why these issues came up. Now, what interests me also, and this is about me, is my indirect teaching practice. My direct teaching are those objectives on the board that everyone can see, but the things that they cannot see is my indirect teaching. And that's my bias. And that's what I bring to the table. And I have to unpack that before I go into my classroom. So for me, I need to be reflective. I need to think about my presentations. And I think during pandemic, so many of us are doing it because I'm hearing everyone say they're exhausted. And I think that's why, because we're spending so much more time on our presentations, wondering what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. We're much more reflective. 
So paying attention not only to my own slides, but videos I see online and those biases as well. So I'm really pushing into my own reflective practice right now. So those are my strategies. Okay, thank you so much. And our closing question for you, when you're not in front of the screen or preparing your wonderful lessons and activities for your students, what do you do for self-care? What are your tips? Um, so I have a fire pit, fire pit in my backyard and one of my best friends is a music teacher and we celebrate every Sunday night. We sort of like throw away the pains. Uh, we celebrate what's coming in the week and we enjoy each other. And I think celebration has been a huge part of my life this year and I'm not forgetting it. Even though we can't go to so many celebrations, I don't think we should give them up. I think we should celebrate the little moments every day. Thank you so much, Margaret. It was great chatting with you. I know I had a really good time too, Vanessa. Thank you. So Mario, welcome back. This has been fun. I've been enjoying this all night long. Thanks, Margaret. I'm so glad that you could join us tonight. Um, so we have one more question from an audience member for you. Um, Ricardo in California asks, how do we ensure all students have equitable, equitable access to the arts preschool to 12th grade? Yes, they're, they're, this is no small question, right? This is really you yeah. know the, the sum total of all of our work. So um, you know, I think about this a lot because this is really what I've been working at for the last 20 plus years, right? Is you know, how do we ensure that um, every student, regardless of zip code or any marker of identity, has that access to a really rich arts education, right? At, at every year of their school career. And that's it shouldn't be as hard as it is, to be honest. Um, and I have to say, I have, I have a bunch of answers, but the one that really sticks out to me is just the simple facts, right? I think that oftentimes um, school decision makers are making decisions that they don't realize impact the arts negatively, right? So I'm a big proponent of really understanding the um, school level and district level data surrounding arts provision, right? So which students have access, how much access they have, how many minutes of instruction, what's the frequency, how many art forms do they have access to, et cetera, et cetera, you know, every year of their school career. And sometimes just by having those systems in place, we start to uncover things that might have just been a scheduling decision, but might not have taken the arts into consideration as strongly. So I'm a big proponent of investing in the systems to track and understand the arts. This is not making the arts into something else. It's just saying, we track everything else in the school. Let's make sure the arts are part of that so that when we look at the data, we don't go, oh my gosh, why is there this weird gap there? Let's make sure like eighth grade hasn't had visual art for three years, What? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And I've had a lot of luck with just uncovering the facts and showing that to decision makers because it's really logical. You, you know, we in the end, everyone's heart is in the right place. We do wanna provide for our students and it's helping folks get over those barriers and hurdles. So mm -hmm. I think we heard a lot, the next things that I was gonna say, we heard tonight, which Vanessa mentioned a lot, which is like, be visible, right? right, right. Be on your school improvement team. I mean, if you're an arts teacher and you wanna see real change and transformation and you wanna work towards ensuring that there's equity for all students, then become a leader with a voice. And you know, I think being part of the school improvement team is, one of the most critical ways because that ensures you have a voice at the table for the biggest decisions, right? You know, every school I know has to do their yes. school improvement plan and that's their strategic plan for the work that they do that aligns to the district's vision. And that's how organizations make decisions. So become part of the fabric of that. And then, uh, Margaret, I know from our time of working together in Chicago, one of the things I saw you do was build allies mm -hmm. and also be selective about your allies, allies that have voice and the right kind of influence so that it's it's sort of the the loudspeaker it's the trumpet that says here's the value of the arts but it's coming from another voice right it's coming from an ally that might com come from a different sector that folks can hear so um so data visibility allies and then you know i would just urge folks to seek out connection rather than separation right so E, look, I was I was an art teacher. I know that it is both a joyous job, but also a 
taxing one, mm -hmm. but don't let the taxing stop you from connecting with others, right? Like it's even more reason to like be bold and step out of your comfort zone. So I think those are some ways that we can, you know, really advocate and fight for that equity and access piece. Well, I, I completely agree with you. And um, I also want to say thank you for always visiting my classroom. You were such a kind person to make sure you came to every show and I value that. Just to let you know that. Um, we have some more questions here. So um, overall, what are you hearing as trends and takeaways from this conversation? Okay, I took a lot of notes. So excuse me, I'll look at my uh, <laughs> notebook here. Um, so I love uh, this uh, comparison that Dr. Hutchings made about science and art, you know, the science of art. I mean, what about parallel processes, right? I have a problem to solve. I come up with an approach to solve that problem. I test my theory and practices. I refine and then, you know, and then I work towards that final solution, hopefully, How, you know, so similar. Um, valuing that voice of student work and really leaning into that because that is really a, such yeah. a powerful tool. And, you know, being choosy about where that um, student work might be presented is also, I think, part of that. Um, and then we heard a lot about this, like, I love the idea of considering the strain on the systems right now, because I think we're all feeling that. I think, John, you made that point. Um, but also um, sort of looking at your own systems, right? Like, how have you been affected by that? Um, how to make others um, feel seen and heard. I heard that about partnership, like getting those defenses down and building that allyship, right? Um, the role of mentors and coaches in this work, um, agency, global citizenship. I mean, you guys have so many good ideas. I'm just giving you the list. Um, be visible, be involved, be heard. Um, I loved your piece around choice and inquiry, Margaret, but also I just thought that, that your piece around direct and indirect teaching, where there, it, this, I don't mean this to sound silly, but it makes me think of like the way Sesame Street was written, right? It was written for kids, but it also was written for adults. So it had this like two layers. And I don't know that every person in a school is seeing all the layers that a teacher is doing simultaneously, right? Like I'm considering myself in relation to others. I'm considering the content. I'm considering the composition, you know, and I think that indirect piece is where our work really lies, especially with equity, diversity, inclusion, right? It's like, start with the I, start with the self, you know, what are we afraid of? Like, ask yourself some tough, tough questions. It's just you, you know, ask yourself some tough questions and be a reflective practitioner because, you know, our students really deserve that. So that was a long list of takeaways, but this is a really inspiring conversation tonight. So we have one more question right now. Um, what advice would you give to art educators at this time? Uh, my main thing is, and I said this before, don't put yourself last, right? We need you. Your whole school community relies on you for passion and independence and creativity. And I know, look, I know not everyone's got the summer off. If you do, take full advantage of it. But in that downtime that you get, like Vanessa said, you know, those moments that you get, find that recharge, right? Don't put yourself last because we don't, look, we're all a little burned out from this year, but you know, find your way to find that joy and recharge uh, because we're, you know, look, we're excited about this coming school year. There's a lot of opportunity. We're, uh, we're actually gonna add a town hall about some of the, um, the national funding through ESSER and the opportunities. And it's like, if we have those kind of opportunities, those dollars behind education, we need to, we need to be well rested, good breakfast and ready to go when it comes to the new school year. So, you know, just take care of yourselves. And with that, what are your tips for your self-care? Um, I don't mean to, to share a funny personal story, but I have to, because it just makes it. So I've been really big on small joys, right? Like, honoring the small joys because that's really what the day's made out of so for example i was so thrilled that my mom and i were both vaccinated i went to visit we usually have a good time but i am moving soon and i was looking for some chairs and i didn't even tell her about this but she was like we have to go to the thrift store and drop off you know this donation and we we go into the thrift store and there's the, like the two perfect chairs and my mom and I had this whole like argument, like loving argument slash debate around like, get the chairs, don't get the chairs. Will they fit in the car? Will they not fit in the car? Do we take the legs off? The chairs ended up being like 30% off of nothing. And we like somehow managed to fit them in my little mini Cooper and drive them home. And it was 
the most joy I could have had. I mean, it was like, I just, for, you know, like, I think the pandemic has made us sometimes forget about like just connecting with a human being and enjoying life. And I just had one of those moments where I was like, oh, maybe we're starting to see a glimpse of what this could be. Um, so that <laughs> my self care is just enjoy those moments because they, they are coming back, you know? Well, Mario, thank you for connecting all of us tonight. Cause this is what a really been very special for me. And I, I can tell from the rest of the panelists as well. And we just have really enjoyed your company and um, your support for all art educators. So thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Always good to see you. You too. Um, so uh, I'm gonna transition us to a few things. So first of all, I just wanted to all acknowledge and thank um, all uh, current and past and future NAEA board members that have joined uh, our conversation this evening and even some uh, have submitted some questions. So uh, thank you friends for being part of us, we appreciate it. And if we can do a big virtual uh, round, thunderous round of applause and show our gratitude and thanks for Gregory, for John, for Vanessa, for Margaret, for really sharing their expertise, being vulnerable, and you know, just like being willing to have the, the real conversation about the things we care about the most. I appreciate all of you. So thank you so much for saying yes and joining us. Um, we do have a little bit of time for other questions. And I thought maybe, and this is going to be rapid fire if, if you're okay with this. And I'd love to hear from each of you. But you know, I think this one of the things that we've identified in our strategic vision of the next five years is the idea of the role of mentorship. So I just, I wonder um, for each of you, um, you know, was, who is somebody, this is like a way to pay tribute, like who's somebody that really played that role for you? And was there like one thing that you're taking away from that person, right? And I'll, I'm gonna, oh, you're ready. I was gonna buy you some time, but John, if you're ready, go ahead. So who's that person and what, what was that one gift they gave you? Uh, mine is Dr. Brent Hasty. I had the great fortune of starting this work and my career, you know, working alongside him in the community he works in. And he did such a great job of not only leading by this great example, being this amazing model, but also giving me insight as to why he was thinking the way he was thinking making the decisions he was making, he helped me understand what I couldn't see. And I think, I think that you don't see that much in leaders and mentors where people just slow down enough to give you that insight so the next time you can make an informed decision. I appreciate that because I know him. I really appreciate that too. Thank you. Who, who wants to go next? Margaret, I see a finger go up. Yep. Sure. Um, so, um, my, um, art instructor from the school of the art Institute, I actually have two, I'm going to throw back to Maggie Phillips. Cause she's the one who taught me about direct and indirect teaching. So I learned that 30 some years ago. And my second instructor was Angela Paterakis also from the school of the art Institute who had so much style and, um, embraced everyone she met. And, um, I, I think she memorized every student's name and never forgot them. So I think that was just an amazing uh, opportunity to get to meet this person who gave the gift of love to everyone. I love that. But I, your point about names, don't, don't names have power? And don't, don't they mean a lot when someone takes the time? Yep, I really appreciate that. Vanessa? Well, um, there's a saying in my district that art teachers um, don't quit. They just retire and kind of go away off into the distance. So my middle school art teacher, um, what we now identify as a lateral entry, I assume she was a lateral entry second career. She then became my colleague when I began teaching in the same district. And her commitment and willingness to teach even as I became a beginning teacher, she was my joy, my happy place, my happy space. So yes, um, I would say Helen Mason. Yes, that's her. <laughs> All right, Helen, nice. Great. And you know, for me, it was really Dr. Billy K. Kennedy, um, who was the first African-American superintendent of Chesterfield County in Chesterfield, Virginia, and the first um, state superintendent for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, he hired me when I was 24 years old, not knowing anything about life as an assistant principal. 
Um, and he told me in my interview, he said, you know what, I'm taking a risk. And I was thinking, I guess what, I didn't get this job. <laughs> and he was like, but you're worth the risk. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm worth the risk. And he stayed in my life even till now. Um, I still, I just talked to Dr. Ken Bay a couple of months ago. Um, every transition that I've made in my entire career, um, I've always given him a phone call. He always starts by saying, I'm not gonna tell you the answer. I'm just gonna ask you questions. And it helps me every time. Um, so he, to me, is the epitome of what I call black excellence. And I stand on his shoulders and many others, but he has been my role model and I think nobody will ever top him. Um, so he'll always be my forever role model. I love that. I love that. And you know, it makes me think maybe we should do it. I'm going to tell my team we should do a town hall just on this, on this exact conversation on mentors because it's so moving. And you know, it's harder as you get older to still have a mentor ahead of you. So for those of us that have them, isn't that valuable? But I always push people to like, you know, keep finding them in your life because they exist. And you know, we we all need that sounding board or that encouragement or someone who's just like even two steps ahead of you, right? Just to help provide some guidance. So I'm gonna tell mine in a minute, but it's gonna come with, I know we have some slides here at the end, so I'm gonna time mine just right whenever we go to those slides. So uh, we're gonna, once again, thank the four of you for this beautiful conversation and thank you to our audience for joining us. And a few announcements, uh, if we can uh, carefully transition to the slide deck, you're gonna see a few things come up. Great, thank you team. So first of all, we tried to uh, make good on our promises of meeting your needs. So for everyone that joined, uh, you can um, scan the QR code and you can download um, at this link. Uh, this is a handout that share our guest um, ideas and reflections uh, similar to what we heard in conversation tonight, but a real tool for it to take away and have something to immediately put to you. So please download this. And um, I always say, you know, especially tonight, we, you know, I think we talked a lot about the, the community that is arts education and how we all work together. And, you know, I wouldn't have found uh, my leadership pathway was if it wasn't for my colleague, Alice. So that was probably my mentor story. We were, we, um, she, I was teaching in an elementary school and she got placed, she was between buildings, but I saw this, you know, this person that kept coming into my classroom and we, every time we were together, we were brainstorming ideas and we did this big identity project with fourth graders and she took me to New York City to NAEA to present our project at convention. And that's how I found my grad school and I found my path to uh, my principal papers and my leadership route and it took me to Chicago. So it was just so critical. And I really think about NAEA all the time about how that was just one of those junctures where like you're sitting on a bench and you you're, you make a decision to go left or right. and. So I say to you know anyone who is looking for that kind of community and that support and that mentorship, you know, consider uh, becoming a member because we, not only do we have tools for your instructional support, but also for your leadership support through SAL, our online blog, our Honor Society for Students, our journals and publications, and we're all really excited to consider our live reconvening of everyone in New York City in 2022 for our 75th anniversary. So pretty exciting times. And um, also because it's this time of year and thank you uh, Vanessa for the Honor Society mention there. Um, uh, I even have props. So um, think about graduation and think about the robes and tassels and cords. And so this rainbow cord is representative of the um, scholarship of our young artist. And you know, when you gather in the honor society or junior art honor society, you know, you're really uh, finding a way for the arts to get back to your community. And so, uh, if you're not involved now, please consider getting involved and also honoring those young people and creating a chapter and having that membership because it's a great way. When, you know, when we talked about the arts are for everyone and you know, you may or may not be a maker yourself, but the Honor Society is a way to find that joy of the arts with others and find ways to give back. So I always encourage people to think about how you might be a mentor to young people and uh, provide this kind of programming at your school and your community. And a few things that are coming up. So um, we have a, our webcasts that are sort of in the moment on uh, current issues and topics. So place-based art and creating community is May 27th, 7 to 9 p.m., free for everyone. 
And then you'll see our webinar coming up that this is a free for NAEA members, but this is a member benefit exclusive. Everyone's really excited about this visual note taking one. So I'm getting excited myself. So, you know, how do those words and pictures come together in a really beautiful, yeah, see, heads are nodding on the screen. You guys know what this is. The visual note taking is gonna be a really stellar um, webinar. So that's coming up June 23rd. Once again, 7 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, thanks to everyone who joined our virtual national convention this year. We had uh, over 4,500 attendees, over 500 workshops, uh, and they're all, everything that was recorded, so over 400 sessions are available still online uh, at the website. And if you didn't have access, you can still purchase access and it's more professional development credits than you could possibly use in a lifetime, let alone the school year. So it's really rich content and it's really great, easy format to use. And just a couple more things. Uh, it's a busy time of year. Uh, I know everyone's thinking about their storytelling, their advocacy. We're hunkering down, making our case for programs for next year. We're thinking about that ESSER funding. The Arts Our Education campaign gives you five critical tools to make the case. So it's a school board letter. It's a dear teacher colleague letter. It's a parent letter. It's an automatic letter to your state representative. And it's like all the tools and language that you might need and you can sign the pledge and also uh, record your own video making the case. And so it's a lot of allyship in this and a, and a community coming together across all art forms. So if you need those tools, this is a great resource. And we have a webinar on this in our archives if it's helpful. And our upcoming town hall. So given how hard we all worked, we wanted to take a minute to acknowledge that Yes, we are all art educators, and many times those lines blur, but we also like to pay attention to the artists within each of our, uh, our members and our colleagues. So we're going to, uh, even though this looks like such a short headliner, art educator as artist, uh, I've assembled some really amazing folks that uh, uplift the artist within and kind of, you know, they're honoring the educator, but they're putting that aside a little bit and just saying, how do I as an adult really dive into my own practice? Uh, and pay attention to that. And so we're gonna have a really creative and fun discussion on June 8th. And I think that is all. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, wish you a really smooth ending to the school year and all the good energy for that um, recovery time. And we're gonna see our animation to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. How'd that go? It was great. It was really good. Yeah, it was awesome. Good yeah. job. What an good awesome job. group. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah good to see you. you all. Really, really meaningful for people. I could tell. Yeah, it was. They were I'm excited. To to the the yeah. <laughs> so so keep up the great work. Thank you for the opportunity. Good to meet all of you. And so um, awesome. yep. And so at some point, Mario, we're gonna have to do lunch or something. That's great. Look, now I gotta see. The, I gotta see these two chairs that you got from your mom with your mom. <laughs> we'll set it up. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate All right, it. talk to you later. Bye. Yep. Good night. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Thank you. Great job. All right. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>